Hi, welcome to Hillcrest Sermons, Growing Together. Show us your heart's delight. Good morning. Welcome, my name's Tim. I uh, serve here as lead pastor and get to uh, unpack scripture, love getting to do that. Um, <clears throat> hope you've been around for Missions Month. It has been a great month uh, as we talk about the ways that we are just expressing care for the world um, as a community and all the different missionaries and organizations that we get connected with. Um, it's been a really, uh, really good month around here. Uh, I just want to invite, as t- so today's kind of the last Sunday of Missions Month. And I just want to invite you, even uh, as we come to this conclusion today, just to think back over the last number of weeks and think about where you felt yourself inspired or challenged by the different things that you've heard or seen. Um, and if today's your, uh, today's your first Sunday, you just think about whatever you want. You've got, you got a little free moment here. Um, but where, uh, yeah, where have you been inspired or challenged? I mean, remember a couple, the, the, the first Sunday when we heard about John, the founder of Love Justice, and their work to, uh, to fight human trafficking. I mean, it just felt like that felt like a holy moment um, when we heard about the work uh, that they are doing. And then the week after that, um, Jonathan Martin's uh, representing World Relief and this care for refugees and the fundraiser that we did that day for refugees in our local community. Uh, or then last week, if you're here last week, and we got to hear about Christian Anderson representing the team at Oregon State University announcing the message of Jesus uh, to students there at uh, Oregon State, and then joining. How fun was it to have the uh, Sikkim students, 170 students and staff here last week? I mean, that was a blast. And it's just like all, I don't know, I felt inspired and challenged. And I just invite you to cons- like remember, like what were the things that grabbed your heart over the past month? <clears throat> I'd also invite you just to think about maybe some of the other some of the other emotions or reflections that have come up over the month. I wonder if, I wonder if some of us, maybe at different times, felt uh, some of that like uh, compassion fatigue. I think that can happen sometimes when we hear about a lot of different needs in the world. Sometimes it can feel tiring. You ever feel that? Or maybe <clears throat> was there ever a moment you kind of felt kind of thinking about your place in God's mission and felt confusion, like, where do I fit in all this? Like, that's really good. I don't know that I'm going to start a nonprofit that's like this global NG. Like, where do I fit into this mission of God? Or maybe, like, we, we always have people who are here with us who are considering faith, checking out faith. And maybe for you, that's where you are. You're exploring uh, Christianity. And maybe for you, you're like, you feel disconnected. Like, I don't even know what I think about Jesus yet, so I really don't know what I think about people telling other folks about Jesus. Maybe there's a disconnect there for you. Yeah, what are, what are just, yeah, what are some of the things that have come up for you this month? I want to kind of, I want to uh, end our series uh, today looking at a passage where Jesus, he really talks about in a very, in a very few sentences, kind of the what and the why and the how of God's mission in the world. I want to look at it with you to kind of, kind of pull these things together and maybe, maybe ground all these different, maybe these emotions, these reflections we have, ground it in first in what Jesus says about God's mission. So let's head there together. If you have your Bible with you, um, I invite you to open up to John chapter 20 is where we'll be this morning. John 20. Um, John is after the book of Luke and before the book of Acts. And uh, yeah, I'll be flipping there now. Um, just to set the scene for us. So John 20 takes place. Uh, this is a Sunday evening. And the previous Friday was the Friday that Jesus was uh, executed on the cross. And uh, we know the story. Jesus was executed. He's laid in the tomb. Uh, late that Friday, and then earlier this Sunday morning, uh, Mary Magdalene has gone, found the tomb empty. Some other disciples have gone and seen the tomb empty. The, the, re- the risen Jesus, the come back to life Jesus, appears to Mary Magdalene. Um, but these other disciples have yet not met the risen Jesus. And they're in this room afraid with the doors locked. 
And that's where we're going to pick up the story today. So John chapter 20, uh, beginning in verse 19. So read this. It's the evening of that Sunday. It says, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands inside. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. All right, so Jesus, I mean, that, you know, it's hard to even, <clears throat> you can hardly even imagine, you know, they're, they're terrified, the door's locked. Like, what would it have been like for the risen Jesus just to appear in their midst? Like, just, you, I, I, can't, it's, I can't even wrap my head around the surprise that this would have been. And, you know, he, he repeats this twice, says, peace be with you. And then he has this incredibly powerful line, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And I, and I think this is so critical. If we're going to talk about what God is up to and our, and our place in the mission of God in this world, I think we need to spend some time with this, this idea, as the Father sent me, so I am sending you. And I want to spend some time just talking about what is, Jesus, what is Jesus saying that means for us? Has the Father sent me, so I'm sending you? I think the first question we have to ask is, what did, how did the Father send Jesus? How did, how did Jesus, you know, as the Father sent me, what did, what did Jesus mean by as the Father sent me? What was Jesus' understanding of how he himself was sent? What he was sent to do, what he sent to accomplish. If I had to summarize it, um, if I had to summarize like my current understanding of, of what Jesus means by this, as the Father sent me, I would say it's something like this. That Jesus says the Father sent him, that Jesus came to announce and enact the life God has to offer. Jesus came to announce and enact the life God has to offer. And uh, let me just talk about that for a moment. Um, so it's interesting. There's these four ancient biographies of Jesus, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And w- one thing you notice if you look at all four of them, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they, ta- they often portray Jesus announcing and enacting the kingdom of God, the reign and rule of God. But when you come to John, the, the biography of Jesus called John, it's actually the, the, the kingdom of God seems to be, uh, there seems to be a different term standing in that place. In the Gospel of John, Jesus often announces and enacts uh, life, the life God has to offer. You can even sometimes it says eternal life. That in the Gospel of John, it's, it's about life and what the kingdom of God did in those other ancient biographies. It seems like the idea that, of life or eternal life is what happens in the Gospel of John. Jesus comes to announce and enact the life God has to offer. He talks about life over and over and over again. If you're interested, you can, um, I have these little study sheets today. I've, they're in back. I'll mention it a couple times, but I put on there all the different times Jesus talks about his offer of life in the Gospel of John. Life to announce and enact the life God has to offer. And it shows up in all different ways. So um, think about, uh, think about the, 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 the wedding at Cana. Jesus comes to bring life, and he makes this best wine at this wedding. And it's this image. It's literal physical wine, but it's also this image of what the eternal banquet we are all invited to looks like. Life. Or then he meets the Samaritan woman, the Samaritan woman at the, uh, at the side of this well. And he says, he says to the Samaritan woman, the thing that your soul has been thirsting for, like I have come to fulfill that. Life. Over and over again, he meets the, a paralyzed man at the side of the pool, Bethesda, and he heals the man's physical body. And then he says to the man that I can also heal your soul. I've come to bring Life. He meets a blind man, and he heals the man's eyes. The man can literally see again, and he can confronts the religious leaders, the Pharisees, and he says, you are spiritually blind in a worse way than this man was physically blind. I've come to help you spiritually see again. He meets 5,000 people who are hungry, and he puts literal bread in their bellies. And then he says, I am the bread of life sent from heaven to feed your soul. That he's come to bring life 
over and over again, life. He goes to the tomb of Lazarus, and he stands at the side of the tomb of Lazarus, and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. I bring new spiritual life. And then he, call, he has them open the tomb and he calls out, Lazarus, come forth. And he brings Lazarus literally back from the dead. He comes to bring life over and over again. He goes to the cross and he takes the sin and death of the world upon himself and he takes it to the grave. And then he leaves it there on Sunday morning. He rises from the dead to bring life, both eternal new spiritual life and eternal resurrection life for all who attach themselves to Jesus. Over and over again, he talks about himself as bringing life. And this life that he brings is big because Jesus is big. And sometimes when, when we're trying to understand the mission, that Je what was Jesus' mission? What did the Father send Jesus to do? The Father sent Jesus to announce and enact the life God has to offer. And the life that Jesus brings is big because Jesus is big, that the scope of redemption is no smaller than the scope of creation. It's big. And I think sometimes we try to, we try to reduce it. And sometimes people are like, well, you know, Jesus, his mission was really just spiritual. It was just spiritual things, just kind of forgiveness things. And when I look at Jesus, I think Jesus says, no, I came to heal bodies and to feed bellies and to restore families and talk about economics. His mission is big. And then sometimes people say, well, Jesus' mission is just about physical things, just compassion, acts, good deeds, this kind of thing. And Jesus says, no, I came to announce that I and the Father are one and any who have seen me have seen the Father and I am the way, the truth, and the life and the way to the Father is back through me. That it's about spiritual things and that it's, it, it's all these things together. Life, yes, spiritual life, forgiveness, being adopted into the family of God, new spiritual life in our souls, but yes, also life, restoring families and restoring bodies and caring uh, for the oppressed and the marginalized life after death that we can never provide for ourselves for eternity. Jesus came to announce and enact the life God has to offer. When Christian Anderson talks about being on Oregon State University's campus, introducing students to the good news of Jesus, he is announcing the life God has to offer. He and his team, they're announcing the life God has to offer. When John and the Love Justice team, they talk about being at the border between Nepal and India, and finding a young woman who is heading to the right red light district down in India and pulling her off the bus and getting her back with her family, they're enacting the life God has to offer. Jesus came to announce and enact the life God has to offer. So that, uh, one, yeah, if, you're, if you want to dig more into this, that's a big idea. This same study sheet talks about life, but then there's a number of things that talk about how word and deed fit together in the mission of God. If you want to think more deeply about it, there's some resources. It's kind of funny. It's a printed sheet, but the, the hyperlinks are um, highlighted. It makes me want to press them on there, but you, you see what I mean there when you grab one after the service. So... Jesus says, as the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. As the Father sent me, Jesus was sent to announce the act, the life God has to offer. But what, is, what about our part? So I am sending you. What about our sentness? How are we sent in a way similar to the way Jesus was sent? Because like at one level, it's very clear we are not sent in exactly the same way. Right? I am not the Son of God sent to take away the sins of the world. Like we are not, that it's not exactly as the Father sent Jesus, so his followers are being sent. And yet it's connected somehow. What is the connection between how the Father sent Jesus and how his followers are then sent out by Jesus? I think the, the actual, the grammar here helps a little bit on how these fit together. It's interesting, um, when you, uh, in biblical Greek, Koine Greek, there's a couple different forms of past tense. There's one form called the aorist tense, which is kind of the generic general past tense. But then there's another form called uh, the perfect tense, which is usually deliberately chosen by the author. And the perfect tense isn't just kind of just a generic, something happened in the past. The perfect tense is, uh, is used to emphasize a past event with ongoing effects, with ongoing implications, with ongoing uh, realities. 
And so when we read here, let's go back. We'll go back to that verse real quick, and then I'll go to this sentence. So uh, again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, this is that perfect tense. It's perfect tense. I was sent in the past, but my sentness has ongoing implications as ongoing, as an ongoing reality about it. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And you go to that next slide now. So the perfect tense is that it represents something that happened in the past, but has these ongoing effects. And so it seems that um, what is being communicated is something like this. It's not that just like Jesus happened to be sent, um, and, it, and it's all over, and then the disciples are separately sent, and it's kind of a totally separate thing. It seems that there's something uh, being communicated like this, that Jesus was sent by the Father. But that has this ongoing effect, this ongoing implications. And now Jesus is sending out his followers, in a sense, as an extension, a continuation of his original purpose and mission. That I, you know, Jesus is saying, I was sent... And, and I did part of that, but it, there's these ongoing effects that now, my followers, I send you to continue my work of announcing and enacting the life God has to offer. That I, my sentness is continuing through you, my followers, who I now give this purpose to, to announce and enact the life God has to offer. And so for, for followers of Jesus, um, that we are, we are sent to continue his mission. And this is, not, this is not an earning thing. It's not like, oh, you need to go do this, work really hard at it, and do it perfectly, or he's not going to be happy with you. Like the life with Jesus is always founded on grace, like the, the free gift of grace found in Jesus. But he gives us this grace. He also gives us purpose. Like his purpose, his mission is a gift to us. And he says, I give you, I give you this, this calling to continue to not only enjoy and appreciate the life for yourself, but to announce and enact it for others. I'm going to continue my mission through you. Central to being a follower of Jesus is to be a person who is sent. Central to being a follower of Jesus is to be a, per a person with a purpose, with a mission participating in the mission that Jesus was originally given. And I think, honestly, in our, our, our culture today, like, purpose is a real challenge for our world today. I was reading um, Terry Eagleton the other day. He's an atheist Marxist literary critic. Uh, very smart man. Uh, I don't agree with him on everything. Um, <laughs> but he was talking about purpose, and here he's got this quote. He says, what are human beings for? The answer is surely nothing. And I think this lies at the root of much of the modern anxiety around purpose. Because when we live in a pluralistic, consumeristic society where we have no, um, ex we have no built-in purpose, that we just have to choose a purpose for ourselves, that one that we think will make us happy. And there are so many competing voices saying this is what your purpose should be, and so many corporations that would love to convince you of your purpose. Like it, it, it could be a great source of anxiety in our world. And Jesus says to be my follower is to be a person sent with a purpose. Jesus says, I'm going to continue to announce and enact the life God has to offer, but through you, my followers. And this, I mean, it's, it's, and it's even interesting. When you look at Jesus, this, his, his uh, sense of like, he is rooted in this identity as one sent. Like Jesus himself he, he knew his purpose. He knew his identity as one sent. And he knew the identity of God as a God who's passionate about the world and is sending to reach the world. I, uh, when I was prepping for this message, I just thought, I was like, man, I wonder how many times Jesus talks about the Father as the one who sends and himself as the sent one. And so I'm just going to do a search for this and just see how many times, you know, go in Gospel of John. 40 times, as far as I could count, 
Jesus identifies his Abba as the one who sends and himself as the sent one. Like, he, this was deep in his identity. I put that list of verses on that same hyperlink sheet um, uh, to take a look at if you want to study this week. But, like, he knew, he knew he was sent. He wasn't wandering around like, I wonder what I should do with my life. Like, he had a sense of what he was about. And he desires to gift his followers that same, uh, that same confidence, that same rootedness in a purpose, in a sentness, in a mission to announce and enact the life God has to offer. So, um, as the Father sends me, so I'm sending you. Jesus is, sound, is sent to announce and enact the life God, God has to offer, and then he continues it through his followers. But how are we supposed to do that? Is it just like, okay, get to work, roll your sleeves up, like work, work, work hard, you better, you know, do your best. Is that it? Because what I actually see, you know, it's really interesting the way uh, what Jesus says here. Because as soon as he gives his, uh, his followers this mission, he essentially implies, you're not going to be able to do this on your own, so I'm going to help you with it. Because look at the next thing that happens, this next verse. So right after he says, as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you, he says, and with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And he goes on, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. But he, he breathes on them, which, you know, there's all sorts of funny stuff. Like he was dead 24 hours ago. Now he's breathing on them. So there's, there's uh, but, uh, and, uh, but what, like why with the breathing on them? I want to go back to the beginning of this, this, uh, this uh, story. Verse 19. So um, verse 19 uh, it says, on the evening of the first day of the week, that's when this all is taking place. Now, if you were uh, an ancient Jewish reader of Scripture, and you thought about the first day of the week, what, what would come to mind for you for the first day of the week? What story? Shout it out. What? what? Creation. The first, first day of the week. First day of the week, yeah, the first, first day of the week, uh, God created the heavens and the earth. And can you remember in the Genesis, the creation story, was there anybody who breathed life into anybody else? Yeah, God breathes life into the first human being. Um, and it's in this, so it, in, in, in Genesis 2, that's what it is. God, God breathed life into the Adam, and he became a living being. Like this breathing life on the first day of the week. It's this image of creation. And it's interesting, there's one other place in Scripture where this breathing life into shows up. It's in the book of Ezekiel when the dry bones, the dead dry bones are brought to life because the Spirit of God breathes life into them. And so this, for an ancient Jewish reader of Scripture, this breathing into someone, the Spirit of God, this was, this was an image of creation. This is an image of resurrection. This is an image of to like new creation, something new happening. And so here, uh, what we're to understand is that, that Jesus is making his followers new from the inside out. That this, the Spirit is doing something in them that was like the first creation, that was like Ezekiel's resurrection. This was new creation in his followers. That, that central to the Jesus movement, Jesus is not looking for nice people to try hard. Jesus is looking to make people new and to continue his work by his spirit through them. He's making new people. He breathes the Holy Spirit onto them. This is Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost, uh, 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, uh, in Acts chapter 2, um, it's when it's this story of the Spirit being poured out on the early church, the early Jesus movement, and uh, the people being empowered to announce the message of Jesus, being empowered for mission. And here, right here on the day of the resurrection, it's like this, almost this pre-Pentecost, this Pentecost foreshadowing, where on the day of Jesus' resurrection, he, he gives his followers this mission, and then he breathes the Spirit, this pre-Pentecost, the Spirit is coming. And it it is going to empower you. And there's this implication, the way the mission and the spirit are inseparable. Like if you're going to do this, if I'm going to continue my mission to announce and enact the life God has to offer through you, you can't do it without my spirit in you. You can't do it without being made new. 
Like we need it. We can't do it in our own strength. I even just think for ourselves, when we think about where, where is Jesus sending us? What is, what is Jesus, how is Jesus wanting to work through my life to announce and enact the good news? Um, when we think about that, if we come to a conclusion and we think, oh yeah, I can do that in my own strength, it's probably not the right answer. Because whatever Jesus is sending us to, it probably should be a place where we end up thinking, oh, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that without Spirit's help. I can't do that on my own. I'm going to need some kind of divine help to do that. Because this is what Jesus implies. The thing that I am sending to you to, you're going to need, you're going to need the Holy Spirit. You're going to need my spirit inside of you, making you new to accomplish this. And that's what he sends his followers into. And then that last line, just to, just to kind of say a word about it, that it could be a little confusing, that last sentence um, where, where he says, you know, um, if you forgive anyone's sins, they're forgiven. Um, if you don't forgive them, they're not forgiven. Just, just to kind of clarify, my understanding, this does not mean that we all get to play the role of God and we have like these judgment sticks that we wave around. That it, it's, he simply recognized the reality that as you go announcing the life God has to offer, as you announce that, the reality is some will embrace this and some will reject this. It's just simply uh, naming that reality. So if I had to summarize this whole, uh, this whole passage, I would say it something like this. That what we see is that Jesus is continuing to announce and enact the life, the life God offers through his people, empowered by his spirit. That's this, this image of mission that we're being given here. And I think it's, just, it's helpful just to name this, name the mission of Jesus, name our role in it, our place in it, as we come to the end of this missions month. And so just as a church, I think the, a question for us is, is, so what do we do with this? What do we, what do, we do with this for our lives? And I would, I would just encourage each one of us to just ask the simple question, like what for, for you personally, what is the next step? What is the next step of letting Jesus do this through you? What's the, what's the next thing? Because sometimes these things can be, they can be so big and it's like eating the elephant, I can't do it all at once, but just what's, what's the next thing? That Jesus is saying, I want to do this through you. It could be, it could be to do with uh, finances. That we, you know, we've been talking about faith promise and committing to that. And maybe, maybe part of the next thing for you is like, hey, is I, I felt led. That I need to, I need my resources to reflect my values, my beliefs. I want to, I want to, I want to resource. I want to commit to this. I want to commit to faith promise. I want to commit to supporting um, this kind of work around the world. Maybe it's that. Maybe it's with your time. Maybe there's places uh, with your time in your life. I've been reading uh, online. I've been reading all about the, uh, the silver tsunami, the coming, uh, the coming uh, number of baby boomers retiring in the next five years, next 10 years. And I've wondered to myself, um, I've wondered to myself, when I think about the church in North America, and I find myself wondering, like, how will this generation who's retiring, how will they spend that time? Like, will we have a generation of elders? And by elders, I don't mean, like, official elders in the church. I mean biblical elders, uh, men and women who use these years to mentor and encourage and pray and resource and pass on the faith to the next generation? Or will we have a generation of retirees, a generation that says, hey, I've worked hard and this season is for me? I wonder, like, what, what is it? Where, what is the next step we're being called to? Or I've talked to other, I've talked to other, you know, um, when we're talking on the theme of time, man, I've run into a number of people um, my age and younger over the last season that are, their goal is early retirement. I'm going to retire when I'm 40 or 45 or 50. And like, and I've, I found myself wondering, uh, what are we going to, what, what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with that time? What is your 
purpose in that. As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. What is that thing that we are being sent to? Or maybe you're on the earlier end of life. Maybe you're in, you're in college, you're coming out of high school or uh, coming out of college, and you're trying to figure out your vocation and thinking through, like, where does my vocational calling fit into uh, my sentness? And maybe it's, it's processing through, like, I feel like I'm being called to be a teacher. I'm being called to be an entrepreneur. I'm being called to be a stay-at-home parent. But understanding that as part of your sentness into the world. Or I hope, I hope, over the past month, I hope there are some folks who have come to the realization, I think I'm, I'm supposed to be a campus m- missionary like I've seen up there. Or I think I'm supposed to... Uh, be part of an organization fighting human trafficking or advocating for refugees. I feel like vocationally I'm meant to do that. Or maybe it's the, the pre-step to that. I feel like I'm, I'm supposed to give a year to be a Kyle intern or join the Hillcrest Foundation program. Maybe those are, those are the next steps for some of us. I hope so. What is the next step for you? Maybe the next step of you is uh, one of these faces around the room. We've got all these different missionaries and organizations around the room. Maybe it's a prayer commitment. Maybe there's somebody, uh, there's a mission or a person or an organization around the room this month that has just captured your heart. Your heart, they've grabbed your heart. And maybe for you, it's like, I'm, I'm committing over the next year. It's not just, I'm not going to just give money. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going, to get, I'm going to email them. I'm going to get their contact information. I'm going to write them letters because I, I wouldn't be surprised if for many of the folks that we support, their needs of relational support, their needs of prayer support are as big or greater than their needs of financial support. And it's a commitment. I'm going to be one of these people. I'm going to be with them. Yeah, what is the next step for you? Maybe, as I said earlier, maybe this month has brought a kind of a fatigue in your heart, a compassion fatigue. There's so many things, there's so many problems in the world, so many things that need your attention. Maybe the next step is getting on your knees and saying, Holy Spirit, will you soften my heart? Will you break my heart again for what breaks yours? Or maybe you're one of those folks that you're just exploring Christianity. You don't know about faith. You're still working out what you think about faith. And maybe when you think to yourself, what is my purpose? There's just a big blank space in your heart. Maybe for you, the next step is exploring the purpose that Jesus says he offers to you. Yeah, what is the next step? I want to end this way. I want to invite the, um, the worship team up here. Uh, this is what, uh, I just think we're, we're ending missions month. Um, and this, we are, we are a community. This is what we are about. These are, uh, men and women organizations that we support. And more than that, we also want to be a, a, a community of people sent, sent in Whatcom and Skagit County and sent into schools, sent into businesses, sent across the street, sent into living rooms, sent into coffee shops. And I just think the proper response to end a month like this is to worship and to pray. And, um, and this has got to be a communal endeavor that we as a community again say that we commit ourselves to this. We commit to being a sent community. We commit to being community better known for our sending capacity than our seating capacity. This is who we want to be. And so I just want to invite us in the next 15 15 minutes to just pray, to worship and pray together. And I and I just invite us to do this in a very interactive way. In fact, I'm going to invite you all, if you're able, to get on your feet right now. And we're going to, we're going to be singing, but I invite you um, some possible prayer responses over the next 15 minutes. Maybe there's a missionary organization around the room that you feel called to pray for. I'd um, ask you to go and put your hand on them and just pray for them right now while we're singing together. I'd love to see every one of our missionaries and organizations being prayed for. Um, maybe there's a person in this room um, that, you, that is on your heart, that you know they're considering stepping into uh, being a vocational missionary or a vocational pastor or one of these things. I invite you to go pray for them. Or maybe that's you. You're considering that. 
I, I would uh, invite you, ask someone to pray for you before you leave this morning. We've been talking about faith promise. We've been talking about uh, making this financial commitment. Um, let me grab one of those faith promise cards. James, can you hand me that one? We've, we've asked people, oh, this is your, yeah. <laughs> it's a joke? Yeah. No, no, it's one of the kids. Oh, it's one of the kids. All right, well, I'm not going to read this out loud. <laughs> Um, but if you, you know, if you fill this out, uh, I invite you, even while we're worshiping, to take this back and to put it in the community drop boxes. There's one there by that exit, and there's one by this exit. And the reason I invite you to do it, even while we're worshiping this morning, so often in a kind of uh, the, the way we do generosity these days, generosity can it can lose some of the act of worship element, and it can be a, just another donation. And there's something good about saying, this is not just a donation. This is an act of worship. And so I, I, if, you've, if you know, like, hey, this is what I'm committing to, I invite you to put it on that card. There's cards back there. You use a community card if you want. It, uh, it doesn't matter what piece of paper it's on. But to put it in one of those community drop boxes, just say, this is my act of worship um, between God and I. And so let's pray. Let's worship. Um, Jesus was sent. His sentness continues but now through us. Let's pray and be open to how he has, uh, how he desires to do that through us. Let's sing together. Thanks for listening. For more info, visit hcbellingham.com and join us any Sunday, 9 and 11 a.m.